that's James's meal for today. Nothing too fancy. And James might be talking about Genius. And I'm going to review Ghosts of War. And then this one, The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne. And um, The Little Things, Top of the Lake, What Still Remains. So we'll see how that goes. Ghosts of War. So this didn't seem to be really um, mainstream Hollywood, but it's still got the top of the stack. It um, It's a kind of movie that I think um, couples could watch if you have very different tastes, like men likes to watch the uh, military sort of stuff and whatever, and uh, there are the woman likes the ghost a story. Fan. Well, you got both in here. So. <laughs> so it might work out and um, this it has a, an interesting a couple interesting twists to it I mean you don't expect you it's very um, well constructed in that it starts out very much a World War two sort of war movie and you see these guys they're tough guys right you wouldn't think they'd uh, scare easily um, and then uh, they get to this house and, and uh, they get spooked. And then it twists again later on. I'm not going to give that away. I mean, because uh, it's interesting. So, top of the stack. It's really well done. The acting was good. I didn't like the one guy guy's acting. I thought uh, the one that was a language expert or whatever. I didn't think he was very believable as a military guy, but whatever. And, uh, or at least not in combat, kind of This situation. is World War II stuff? Ish. I don't want to give it away. So I can't really tell you more about okay. that movie because it's worth watching. I don't want to give it away. It's very good. The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne. This one, if you even like cats just a little bit, you will love this movie because, um, well, the acting is good. I've never seen... Benedict Cumberbatch act as he had in this. He's a I very think it's Cumberbund, but sure. sure, go ahead. And then, um, anyway, the, he, um, I, I guess it's, I would imagine it's based on a true story, but I don't know. I've never heard, and James hasn't heard of this Louis Wayne guy, but... No. Um, I might have seen some of his work. He did cats or something? Cats. A lot of cats, yep. apparently. And um, it's so cute because uh, the guy likes cats so much. He is convinced that, well, he, he believes in uh, that electricity moves us through life. And um, he's eccentric. And he believes that his cats, uh, that they're going to... Uh, start talking and whatever. <laughs> and he, so there's some. It's really cute. Really cute. Um, there's subtitles. Not for much of the movie. For the cats because they don't speak English yet. But anyway, the little things. Now this one has um, some familiar faces like Denzel Washington and. Uh, it really, it's quite long. I can't, don't know what it says here, but 128 minutes, yeah, quite long. But uh, it, it's a pretty good detective sort of story. But at the end, you're like, okay, well, things didn't really get resolved. Do you think that, I mean, you're under the impression, oh, well, they probably did get the right guy. But I don't know. It wasn't good enough for me. I didn't feel good enough about that ending. I... But maybe others would. I'm not sure. So it didn't get top of the stack, even though it... I mean, they would have put a lot more money into making that than they did into Ghosts of War, but Ghosts of War, they did a way better job. Top of the Lake. This one has Elizabeth Moss in it. And, um... I think she must have been younger then. And, um, because she looks younger, but I, I don't know. Yeah, 2014. Honestly, I just thought it was really boring. And 
I don't know why anybody would bother to watch it except for the nice scenery, which I I suspect is authentic New Zealand scenery, but I don't know. I haven't been to New Zealand yet. Uh, New Zealand looks great. Uh, well, the South Island, North Island is probably overpopulated. Serious. What still remains? was awful just awful it's not worth watching at all I guess it's sort of supposed to be like a zombie-ish post-apocalyptic sort of thing but it's it's just boring and stupid and nobody nobody would want to watch this movie not even the people who made it not even their families not even their moms to say oh yeah I want to see my daughter in that no you don't Nobody wants to watch it. So that's all I have to say. And um, that's my stack for today. And there we go. Now you saw this and you reviewed it, right? I uh, did. Uh, but I know you're going to have a lot more to say about it than I did. Yeah, I wish I didn't. You, you know, uh, but... Uh, they did a great job. Uh, you know, like, uh, I tend to find documentaries and mockumentaries as I get older and hopefully more mature. I used to make this joke, uh, people would ask me, or I'd hear people saying, what does uh, so-and-so want to be when they grow up? And I, I'd always say, or yeah, uh, mature, or uh, or an adult, or something like that. So many people, especially nowadays, don't do it. But um, as I get older and hopefully more mature, I am less and less interested in Re imagine, imagining and reimagining stuff, and I'm interested in something that at least uh, pretends or to be reality or makes claims to be representing reality. So this has, uh, I don't know how many uh, installments, it's a series, a TV series, and I don't think I've made any secret of my preference for TV nowadays, at least certain types of TV to movies. Uh, movies seem to uh, cater nowadays to the adolescent male market. Uh, you know, I, I like comic books pretty good and some of the stuff that's made it into the movie theaters based on Marvel and DC and maybe some other comic characters uh, I like okay but uh, you know, there are other things in the world besides uh, comic book and comic book characters and things like that. There really are. Anyway, uh, how many installments would uh, there have been? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe a dozen or something like that. So uh, it's going to take a, a lot of your time if you're going to do it justice or whatever. But Direct it's so it. worth it. Well, that's what I figure. I mean, even I enjoyed watching it, and I mm -hmm. didn't. I didn't expect to. Watch yeah, it. so they have a lot of stuff. Maybe half of it on Young Einstein. So they have a kid playing him. And then they have a, a, a young man uh, playing him. And, you know, like I can recall one uh, science commentator or something like that saying uh, he didn't like this iconization, I might not have used that word exactly, of the elderly Einstein. Einstein spent the last, pretty well, 30 years of his life, a, a generation. Um, on the outside of the scientific community. Twenty, the 20 years before that, he was increasingly lionized. And then along came quantum theory. It really started maybe 19, let's say 12, but it should have been 13 because it was kind of unlucky for uh, science in general. It was also unlucky for Einstein, but it didn't really uh, uh, take off until 1925 with uh, dude called Niels Bohr and not Niels de Bohr that was 1913 but um, and he's in this movie a representation of the same but uh, Erwin Erwin Schrödinger and um, Werner Heisenberg and both I don't know if Schrödinger makes it into this movie but Heisenberg definitely is in here or into this series this TV series So, uh, for the scientist was saying he didn't like the lionization or iconization of Einstein, the latter day Einstein, you know, with the oh, woolly white hair and all that sort of stuff. 
a little bit overweight. He preferred the uh, he preferred if people lionized the younger Einstein. Uh, you know, who had he actually had dark hair like this at one point in time, and then it became kind of peppery and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I think he's being portrayed as being a little bit uh, fitter than he was, even when he was young. He's, he, was, he wasn't rotund. You wouldn't even call him pudgy, perhaps. But he was carrying more weight than someone who really wants to operate at the highest levels of thinking should be carrying. And you're probably getting an idea from me saying that, that I'm not exactly enamored of even the younger Einstein and was you know and you if you've been tuned in earlier all half dozen of you or even fewer that watch this sort of stuff around the world um, you probably get an impression that I'm not terribly you've already got the impression that I'm not terribly impressed with Einstein well, as a human being, perhaps. Well, he had a sense of humor, but that's uh, to a large extent when he, you know, he was still lionized, even though the scientists weren't accepting his opinion. So he'd, he'd have little sound bites for the press that were actually, I think, made up, and sometimes maybe even on the spur of the moment, and uh, he ended up being kind of lovable. He wasn't even a lovable curmudgeon, I don't think. Uh, his politics were. Uh, as we've been able to see increasingly as the years go by, uh, questionable you know, the pacifism and stuff like that uh, in the face of Hitler. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, doesn't quite work. So where does this all start? There's a scene fairly early on where you've got the young Einstein, where he still had uh, uh, dark black hair and stuff like that. He's doing, is it? No, no, it's it's older. He's older, but he's reviewing how he arrived at his theory. And it has him drawing a straight line for light. And light isn't a straight line. It doesn't come in rays. It comes in waves. The waves going like this. It comes in waves that spread out from the source. So already, you know, when you're dealing with a line, you're dealing with a mathematical abstraction to help scientists but you got to be careful with these kinds of models uh, and these models can be mathematical and not just geometrical or uh, even more figurative than that you got to watch that you don't get carried away with it so he's got a line and then he's got really the way light seen in um, profile would kind of look if you did an abstract sine wave. What does sine mean in Latin? It means a bay, actually. But we use it to describe a curve. A sinus, I guess, they figured inside your head uh, was uh, something that uh, was a bay or a curve. Okay. So a sine wave. It's something that goes like this. The profile of water, when someone chucks a... If, if you're looking at it from the side, the surface of water, when someone chucks a rock, it goes like this, away from the, the source of disturbance, the rock hitting the surface of the water. So he draws that. And then he's talking about sound. And it's important, it's vitally important to look at sound as compared and contrasted with light. So he said, sound needs a medium. There's a medium in between me and whatever's picking up my voice in the camera that's recording this. There's a medium, it's air. But you know, there's a medium when a, that's not necessarily all air, it, it might not be very much air at all. When a doctor auscultates your, uh, you for your heartbeat. Auscultation. Auscultatio. Uh, auscultatia, uh, auscultationis, probably what it is in the original Latin. 
what does that mean? It main, mainly, basically means to hear. And the French screw it up by saying, écoute. That's their version of ascoltare, probably uh, the Latin. Écoute. They, they drop the S out. They change the AU at the beginning to an E. Uh, they change the L, Auskal, into a U. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. Uh, kind of like uh, linguistic history. Which we don't want to touch on too much. But the doctor is getting stuff that's, I don't know what all is involved, uh, going from the uh, thing that he puts on your chest to his ear. But inside your body, there'd be liquids, it's mainly liquid, but there'd be some solids and stuff like that. Yeah, sound gets carried, I gather. I've never experienced it. You can hear pretty well, maybe even a little bit better underwater uh, than you can when you're uh, in, the, uh, in the air. And, or talking in the air, talking to someone else in the air. And uh, I gather you can hear even better if, uh, if it's a particular type of solid, like uh, maybe uh, metal or something like that. You can hear quite well if you, there, you can hear stuff going through a door. Uh, or, you know, like I, I used to have some people who lived upstairs from me. Uh, they're dead now. They should have died of embarrassment. Noise, noise, noise. All the time. 11 o'clock at night, past. Uh, grandkids, boom, boom, smash, smash, TV going. I mean, uh, that's how I've never, I don't think I've ever seen the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, but boy did I hear it. So I'm downstairs of them. I, I know it's the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I can hear Will Smith. I've experienced hours of Will Smith. And, uh, you know, I had to get up at 7 o'clock. No, I had to get to work by 7 o'clock in the morning, and I like getting my eight squares. Three square meals a day and eight squares uh, hours of sleep a night. And uh, so, yeah, sound needs a medium. And really what we should say is media, medium, Latin, neuter. So the plural has an A at the end. U-M, so many of the neuter uh, Latin words end in U-M. These would be nouns. And when you pluralize them, you put an A there for the ones that end in U-M. There might be the occasional exception, but that's the general rule. Media, mediums, to explain it for you. There are several mediums, many, 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 many. Ones that are used for sound and ones that could be used for sound. That's just here in the world. Lord only knows what it's like in the... Uh, wide expanses of outer space. Media, plural. Many for sound. So what was, ha I don't know, who came up with this concept of having a medium for light? For light. So what Einstein does is he's drawn the straight line on this blackboard, getting back to that, and then he's drawn a sine wave, which is supposed to represent in profile the movement of light as it goes through space. Not necessarily outer space. Boom, boom, boom. And then he's saying, but in a vacuum, outer space, or inside a vacuum tube or something like that, there's supposed to be an ether, but that's in any space. An ether, the ether. And so he takes the side of the chalk, it must be the side of the chalk, and he scribbles all over it, all over this pattern, the straight line, the sine wave pattern. And he says, that doesn't exist. Who's responsible for that concept? Einstein. Now, who's responsible for the original concept, that scribbling, that's represented by the scribbling of the chalk on the board? I... The, the one who's most immediately responsible for Einstein, from what I can gather, is James Clark Maxwell. It's spelled Clerk Maxwell, but James Clark Maxwell. Maybe about uh, 1860, so about 40, a generation and a half before Einstein really uh, gets launched on the world. That's 1905, four uh, key papers, including one on relativity, but there's one on the photoelectric effect, there's one on Brownian motion, there's one uh, uh, 
claiming at least to prove molecules. I, I don't doubt that uh, molecules exist. It'd be kind of silly uh, to deny them, but uh, deny their existence. Uh, although, you know, like uh, I'm willing to entertain the possibility. It's just not something I'd want to, uh, I think it'd be a waste of time. And I've forgotten what the fourth uh, thing was written on. Uh, photoelectric effect, relativity, Brownian motion. Oh, there we go, the fourth, 1905. So James Clark Maxwell is going along, and uh, he did some amazing stuff. Uh, uh, he might have been the first. Uh, he's uh, claimed to be the first to have said, you know, light is an electromagnetic phenomenon. Okay, that's brilliant. Uh, and I think he's the one who's uh, said, you know, there's, there's light has this uh, certain speed limit. What is it, 300,000 kilometers per second? That's per second. That's not per hour. It's stunning, stunningly fast. So uh, he has this concept, and I think it might go back to Newton or even earlier. Oh, no, it wouldn't be Newton, because Newton had this concept that light was a particle. It wouldn't need a medium. But uh, the ether. So let's capitalize not just E for ether, but the T in front of the. The ether. It's, it's supposed to be amazing. It extends through all of space. And I guess the concept back then was space was infinite. It just went on and on forever. And it was fixed. I gather the concept was it was fixed in space. So, wow, that's amazing. It's just standing still. Is that anything like what the media, plural, are for sound? Oh, that media in between the cam my mouth and the camera is moving. It's not anything like this concept that Maxwell, and I gather his predecessors had, of the medium, the ether, it was supposed to be for light. It's supposed to be fixed in space. What? Say what? You know, this uh, door that Pauline opened a while ago, it conducts sound, and she just moved it. You know, like, uh, look at this. Water. It carries sound. It's moving around. Wow. How unlike the ether, which is supposed to be fixed in space. So maybe 20 years or so after uh, James Clark Maxwell, you know, he comes up with the famous four equations for electromagnetic stuff, and from what I can tell, they're awesome. I'm not the kind of person who actually believes in the total efficacy of equations. The abs let's call it the absolute value of equations. Equations are basically just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Now, equations have got to, you know, you make a prediction in science and the, the stuff better uh, work out. You know, it better work out within an order of magnitude, preferably even better. What does that mean? By a factor of 10. But I don't think Michael Faraday, who's supposed to have been the, you know, maybe 200 years ago, a little less, uh, it's much of his work. I don't think uh, he was uh, really good with equations, but he's uh, called, and maybe with some justification, the greatest experimental scientist ever. It's important to actually come up with concepts. And then when it comes to equations, that helps you determine whether those concepts have validity. You know, uh-oh, you know, I'm off by an order of magnitude of a hundred. Mm. Uh, okay, you know, maybe this thing ain't working out. You know, so it helps you when you're, when you're doing experiments to find out whether uh, your scientific model or uh, predictions actually work. So James Clark Maxwell makes his, uh, you know, like he's come up with this idea. He hasn't come up with it, but he's passed it on, this idea of the ether. I'm not sure if uh, he's the one who decided it was going to be fixed in space. And uh, there are a couple of Americans, as I recall. It's spelled Mickelson and then Morley. No problem with that. But they say, apparently, Michelson and Morley. They did this experiment, and they were looking at light coming from, uh, I guess, from stars. 
and they're looking at the earth going this way and then going this way in space and they're going holy smokes you know the the light coming this way seems to be registering the same speed when the earth's going like this as it's going away and so um they're saying geez you know like uh um there's no eat if they, if there were an ether there you you wouldn't expect that so uh people sat on that for about 20 years uh, a guy called Lawrence came up with the Lawrence effect, and he's saying, you know, it it kind of looks as though uh, things get shortened, going one way, uh, you, know, you know, like uh, because of uh, light, um, lights movement and stuff like that. And but no one uh, acted on until Einstein. Einstein comes along and says the Lawrence effect, which is an appearance, it's supposed to be uh, something that appears, it actually exists in reality. Things get shorter, you know, like uh, when they get, uh, when things are going uh, faster than, or almost as fast as light, getting up towards light speed. So, wow, okay, that's that seems pretty wacky. And people are jumping all over. Now, I'm going to be, uh, I'm not going to have uh, enough time to uh, cover everything I want to cover about Einstein. But I'm going to pull out a book, Born to Rebel, and it's talking about creativity and birth order. And it points out the possibility, and I, they are actually saying strong pro probability, that birth order doesn't exactly determine, but it influences people's creativity, at least male creativity. He, the person who did that book was looking back at historical stuff and saying you know, science and so on and so forth, politics as well. And uh, so it's creativity or receptivity to new ideas. And he's uh, saying, I, I really don't have enough uh, female historical figures to go, you know, for any studies that I might do to be statistically significant. So, uh, he talks about Copernicus, he talks about Galileo, creative. Then he comes to Einstein and Niels Bohr, the founder of relativity and the founder of quantum theory, if you exclude the possibility of, or the, the idea that Max Planck, maybe 1901 or something like that, who's in this movie, uh, he uh, came up with the idea of quanta. But quantum theory, you'd have to say, started with Niels Bohr and then took off a little over 10 years later with Heisenberg and Schrodinger. Um, you've got Yeah, I kind of lost my uh, track of thought. It's a little early in the, in the morning. Well, you were talking about waves, mm. light waves, mm. and then Lorentz effect. Yeah, exa oh, there we go. So Einstein comes along and he says, uh, the Lorentz effect is, is not just an effect. And uh, he's going, okay, you know, outer space is full of nothing. I hope I'll excuse the paradox. But it's not my paradox. Well, that one's my paradox. But his paradox is that light is a particle. That's the way it gets uh, through these vast um, spaces of vacuum from the sun, from uh, stars, uh, Proxima Centauri, which is 